Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Dr. Sarah Kapelovich, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington and the director of training of the Northwest MHTTC. We're excited to bring this webinar to you on the topic of suicide among individuals with behavioral health conditions. We're honored to be joined by Dr. David Jobes, an international expert in suicidology, who I'll be introducing shortly. Dr. Jobes will be providing a brief overview of suicide theories, assessment, interventions, and treatments. We're extremely grateful that he's sharing his expertise with us on this important topic. This one-hour webinar is sponsored by the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. The MHTTC network is a nationwide network that's supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration with the purpose of disseminating and implementing evidence-based practices for mental health disorders into the behavioral health workforce. The MHTTC network consists of a national coordinating office, 10 regional centers, a tribal affairs center, and a Hispanic and Latino center. Together, our collaborative network supports resource development and dissemination, training and technical assistance, and workforce development to the mental health field throughout the United States. The Northwest MHTTC is based at the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. We provide training and technical assistance in evidence-based practices to behavioral health and primary care providers, as well as school and social service staff whose work has the potential to improve behavioral health outcomes for individuals with or who are at risk of developing serious mental illness in Region 10, which is uh, including Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And the topic of suicide assessment, management, and treatment is particularly relevant to our region since three of the four states in our region have among the highest rates of completed suicide in the U.S. Broadly, our goals at the Northwest MHTTC are to heighten awareness, knowledge, and skills of the workforce addressing the needs of individuals with mental illness, to accelerate the adoption and implementation of mental health-related evidence-based practices across our region, and to foster alliances among culturally diverse mental health providers, policymakers, family members, and clients. It's our intention to always be mindful of using language that promotes recovery and a culturally appropriate terminology. We encourage all clinicians to use and champion for person-first language, which emphasizes the individual, not the condition or the disability. Person-first language is a way to demonstrate respect for a person's dignity and worth. It is consistent with recovery-oriented practices and promotes treatment environments that foster respect human dignity, and hope. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our resident expert today. Dr. David Jobes is a professor of psychology, the director of Suicide Prevention Laboratory, and associate director of clinical training at the Catholic University of America. He is also an adjunct professor of psychiatry in the School of Medicine at Uniformed Services University. He has published six books and over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles. Dr. Jobes is a past president of the American Association of Suicidology, and he is the recipient of numerous awards for his scientific work, including the 1995 American Association of Suicidology Schneidman Award for his early career contribution to the field, the 2012 AAS Dublin Award, and the 2016 AAS Linehan Award for Suicide Treatment Research. He has been a consultant to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences, the National Institute of Mental Health, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Defense, and Veterans Affairs. Dr. Jobes is a member of the Scientific Council and the Public Policy Council of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. He is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and is board certified in clinical psychology through the American Board of Professional Psychology. Dr. Jobes maintains a private clinical consulting and forensic practice in Washington, D.C. Dr. Jobes, thank you again for joining us, and I'll turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So I am delighted. Uh, Sarah, I appreciate the kind introduction and uh, the, the focus on this topic today, which is my 
my passion, my life's uh, work um, in the area of uh, clinical suicidology, and hopefully it'll be useful to your uh, your network, and I appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, briefly just go through my conflicts. Uh, disclosures are important, but they also kind of situate the talk I have to share with you today. I'm a treatment researcher um, and have grant funding from the federal government uh, in various capacities from the Department of Defense and from NIMH, and a grant from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, I'm also involved in process improvement work, which is really relevant to this webinar because we do um, uh, investigations and engagements, for example, with the military, but in private sector as well, trying to raise the standard of care across a healthcare system um, when there's been suicides or a, a desire to improve practices. Uh, I receive book royalties um, and I'm a co-owner of a, a training and consultation company. And when I talk about uh, the DOD or VA, I'm talking for myself and not for the government. But, uh, impress upon everybody that we are um, facing huge challenges in the part of the world that uh, the Northwest part of the world, um, as Sarah suggested, there's significant rates of suicide. You can't necessarily read these documents, but I can give you impressions that are important. We're talking about the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, uh, you know, approximately 47,000 at this point um, uh, uh, per year deaths, and that's probably a conservative number. 1.4 million Americans, these are adult numbers typically, um, and then 10.6 million Americans who suffer from suicidal ideation. These are tremendous numbers. Um, I wanna especially emphasize the 10,600,000 adults uh, in the United States who suffer from suicidal thoughts. This is a massive number and doesn't really get the focus of our concern as much as completions and attempts do. Um, this is roughly the, the, this is actually larger than the, the state population of Georgia um, and a massive part of the problem that I want to emphasize in the course of our discussions. What you have here on the left is uh, um, the data from the American Association of Suicidology, looking at different epidemiology um, data. Uh, the lower uh, corner here is um, the persistent rise of suicides over the last 25 years, different kinds of ways of breaking out that data. And this middle slide uh, is from the former director of NIMH, Tom Insull, that shows the, the relatively flat line spending for suicide research. I think that's changing. Um, the new NIMH director, Josh Gordon, is very focused on suicide prevention. And I think we're going to see um, what happens. You know, it's not just money, but when I was first in the field, um, AIDS-related mortality was neck and neck with suicide. And now we don't even see it in the top 15 leading causes of death. Um, AIDS is not a death sentence as it once was. It's now a chronic illness. Um, and so we would like to see more funding, obviously, to, you know, to move the needle on suicide, um, this major public health issue. Right here in the right-hand corner is a cover page of a meta-analysis that was conducted by Joe Franklin, who's a professor at Florida State University. And Joe um, really blew a lot of us away by doing a meta-analysis of 50 years of research on risk factors. Um, for a lot of us, risk factors have been sort of the way that we think about suicide risk. And Joe showed um, that they have remarkably little predictive validity, that we might as well be effectively flipping a coin. Um, not much in terms of predictive validity. So um, risk factors have value, but I'm going to emphasize more uh, the focus on warning signs and what we think of in our intervention as drivers. And I'll get to that as we proceed. So for perhaps some of you, you don't know what clinical suicidology is. It kind of subsumes a number of domains, theories, assessment, treatment, um, and all of this is suicide specific in nature, professional training um, and risk management, process improvement projects. And uh, I teach ethics in my PhD program and I'm married to a lawyer. So I think a lot about ethics and risk management, um, which of course for a lot of people is kind of wrapped up in the suicide challenge. So let me walk you through some of the major prevailing theories. This is not exhaustive, but these are sort of the hot theories these days that are shaping a lot of the research. Perhaps the most prominent is Thomas Joyner's interpersonal theory. Um, this theory has been around maybe 10, 15 years, but it's driven a lot of research, very heuristic theory. You'll see that the lion's share of the model is on the relational aspects of suicide, that many folks perceive that they're a burden on their loved ones. I know for your population um, working with severe mental illness, that many of these patients experience themselves as being um, really a, a, a pain in the neck for their loved ones. 
and that their life and their challenges are a burden to their family is not uncommon in such um, populations to perceive that my death would be a favor to those who love me because I'm such a difficult, impossible family member. Um, and that can contribute significantly to suicidal ideation. The other part of the relational model is thwarted belongingness, that we um, all have a need to be attached and connected to meaningful relationships. And many suicidal people experience rejection. So uh, the, the biggest part of the model here is that you're a burden on those who love you and that you're rejected by those you want to attach to. And then the other part of the model is this idea of acquired capability, which is that um, Thomas argues we're not supposed to kill ourselves. We really um, are wired evolutionarily to live and survive. So through different kinds of exposure, he would argue that we develop a capability to actually want and desire death. Um, that can be through trauma. That can be through severe mental illnesses. That can be through your own multiple attempts. But the accumulation of this um, moves you through exposure from being fearful of suicide to actually cultivating or desiring suicide. And where these intersect is where suicide attempts and deaths occur. So it's a, a, a sort of a perfect storm kind of model of different forces coming together. This is Roy O'Connor's model. It's uh, the integrated motivational volitional model. It's a more complex model. With more complexity, you have more uh, details and more um, richness, um, but you have more complexity. So in all these models, you're gonna see sort of pluses and minuses. Um, Roy begins with a pre-motivational background that's informed by our biology and by the environment and by life events that uh, in, uh, further shape a motivational phase. This pathway here of defeat, entrapment, and suicidal ideation and intent is what lands us in the volitional behavioral category. What's cool about Bory's model is that he identifies a number of moderators and things that define and make up these moderators. And in a model like this, he can do research and is doing research on all these different bubbles and their relative contribution to this fatal, to this potential fatal or attempt outcome. So more complex, but um, rich in that complexity. David Rudd and Craig Bryan have something called the fluid vulnerability model. Um, and they emphasize and follow up on the work of Aaron Beck on the suicidal mode. Their emphasis is on acute and chronic states and an emphasis on warning signs. The way I like to think of warning signs is um, in terms of risk factors and how they relate to warning signs. Uh, many people walk around with uh, risk factors for heart disease. Um, most people don't have heart attacks. If, however, you have warning signs, uh, radial pain in the arm, uh, chest pains, um, shortness of breath, you're in much more near-term proximity to a possible heart attack. So obesity, um, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking are risk factors, but people live with those. But if they have these warning signs, they're in much more sort of dire circumstances. In the CAMS model that I'll describe later, we talk about drivers, which is an even more refined idiosyncratic nature um, that we ask suicidal people, what makes you want to kill yourself? And those um, problems are what we call drivers, which are in effect kind of personalized warning signs. What's the straw that breaks the camel's back for any particular patient? I'll talk about that a bit more later. But what uh, David and Craig have described is that there can be chronic states, there can be acute states within chronic states, and these, uh, these constructs wax and wane over time in different um, kinds of triggers. Very popular theory right now is uh, David Klonsky and Alexa May's ideation action framework or the three-step theory. Um, this is a big preoccupation in the field. We uh, tend to downplay the importance of ideation because we're so focused on attempts and completions. I'm gonna counter that uh, later in the talk, but essentially um, what takes somebody from an ideational range into actually getting into behavior? What David and Alexa argue is that pain and hopelessness are key um, to ramping up ideation and that connectedness from borrow from Joyner's work is critical and then acquired capability is critical. Um, and that's how we move from an ideation to, to attempt framework. Um, we're collaborating with these guys uh, using some of the data from our research to test at least the first two steps of this framework. So that's just a bit of an idea of some of the um, ways that we're conceptualizing or thinking about models that drive both research and inform clinical care. 
Next step in the process is thinking about um, identifying suicide risk. Um, this is the PHQ-9 on the left and the Columbia rating scale. These are widely used screeners, uh, mostly because they're non-proprietary. So they're available on the internet um, and that price is right for many providers. Um, there are um, many other screeners out there. There are two in particular that our friends at the NIH are working on. One is called the AS, the ASQ, and that's for adolescents and teens. That's a non-proprietary uh, excellent screener with excellent psychometrics developed by Lisa Horowitz and her group at NIH. There's another one called ASCM, A-S-Q apostrophe E-M, that is under development um, for adult populations. These are basically three to four question screeners. They will, uh, uh, the ASC is non-proprietary, the ASCM will be non-proprietary. We're collaborating with Lisa at uh, Walter Reed here in the DC metro area in developing different populations uh, for psychometric purposes. But in the meantime, the Columbia and the PHQ-9 are widely used. Item number nine um, is a conflated question about being better off dead and hurting yourself. We would rather have a, a single question about ideation. But uh, the good news is that Greg Simon has done some great work in the Northwest area, um, looking at large samples and the use of the PHQ-9. Um, and so these are, these are um, in our view, valuable to sort of trigger the assessment process uh, at the screening level. It's become uh, rather fashionable to criticize screening. I'm not in that camp. I think that we need to ask about suicide risk. Um, it's hard to do a lot of intervention if we um, aren't at least asking the question. That opens the door to a number of scales uh, that are out in the published literature that clinicians typically don't use. Um, we actually did a study about why clinicians don't use these. Some of them are too long. Some of them you have to buy. Uh, a number of them give you uh, scaled scores that don't translate into clinical practice uh, in a ready way. Um, I'm most uh, in support of the scales coming out of Dr. Beck's lab at the University of Pennsylvania, along with Greg Brown. These have some of the best psychometric uh, test construction. Um, they are proprietary, but they are um, really some of the better scales in the field. I remind all of us that Paul Meal was a, a uh, the late Paul Meal was a professor at the University of Minnesota. And Dr. Meal um, did a series of fascinating research studies looking at um, clinician judgment versus actuarial assessment tools and showed in study after study that uh, assessment tools beat clinician judgment in study after study. Clinicians don't care, we like our gut judgment, but my argument would be that these things are not mutually exclusive and you can, you can supplement your judgment with a, a standardized tool. Um, when we think about assessment, we mostly think about direct assessment. Um, we think about a clinician sitting down with a patient and asking certain questions um, about suicidal thoughts and access to means and so forth. We know from the literature that a lot of clinicians avoid this topic. Uh, we know from a paper that came out a couple of years ago that sometimes providers ask leading questions. You're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? You wouldn't do something stupid like kill yourself. So, um, you know, we don't want you doing that. We want you asking very forthrightly, um, have you had suicidal thoughts? And can you tell me about those thoughts? Favorite question of mine is that when you think about suicide, does it comfort you or does it alarm you? Um, so we all can, you know, to me, the more sort of direct questioning, the better um, in terms of getting at the root of the, of the ideational um, way that the patient's thinking. Um, really exciting. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a meeting of the ASHI group in uh, Vail, Colorado. This is a very unique uh, meeting that's been held now for uh, this is our 10th. The first six were held in um, Switzerland, um, and now we're in Vail. The thing about the ASHI approach is that we've worked very hard, and I was really appreciating, Sarah, your introduction, to be patient-centric, to use non-judgmental language to really be validating and empathic of the patient's experience. There's a heavy emphasis on narrative um, and not looking at the patient as a DSM diagnosis, but as a person. Um, so this has garnered some level of support. Um, people come to these conferences. Um, we published a book that nobody really buys, but it's a good book um, uh, published by the American Psychological Association, How We Build a Therapeutic Alliance with a Suicidal Person. Um, there are, as I suggested, different assessment tools that are not widely used. Um, the Columbia is one of the more prominent, and that's because there's a non-proprietary version of it on the internet. There's also a proprietary version. Um, a recent study has been conducted by Thomas Joyner and Pete Gutierrez looking at um, some of the top assessment tools, including the Columbia, um, and found that they were all pretty much equally um, uh, effective 
uh, that no particular assessment tool stands out in their study. A very um, big interest in the field right now is on something called indirect assessment um, and looking at attentional bias. And uh, this is the Kessler um, K10 developed by Ron, who's at uh, Harvard University. Um, this is a symptom-based uh, assessment that doesn't directly ask about suicide risk. Um, but we did a study at the Mayo Clinic, and the lead author was Stephen O'Connor, looking at a profile of the K10 that imbues a higher level of suicidal risk. Uh, and that paper was published um, in Comprehensive Psychiatry. So the idea here that is that suicidal people or non-suicidal people know that the S word um, triggers a lot of interest and sometimes mobilizes systems. So the real challenge is how do we get around the manipulative or instrumental threat of suicidal thoughts um, for people that are genuinely suicidal and deny it and people who are not really interested in ending their life but insist that they're suicidal. And I mean this descriptively, not pejoratively. Um, it's a big challenge and that's why these indirect assessments are, have been sort of fascinating to the field because the patient doesn't necessarily know that we're asking about suicide. Now that may feel like ethically dubious, but there's an issue of internal validity here that's really important about who is genuinely at risk. The implicit associations test has been with us for many years. Matt Nock at Harvard was the one to apply it to um, suicide risk assessment. And Matt uh, got a MacArthur Genius Award uh, for this research paper, um, looking at um, the use of the IAT, which is administered on a computer where there are different stimuli presented. This is the suicide stimulus. There's an opposing slide, uh, life me, death not me, live. These are presented very rapidly at a sub-threshold level of perception. And what is being measured is your re reaction time to the stimuli. For people that react quickly to the sub-threshold uh, presentation of the suicide stimuli, Matt found that there was a prospective increase of attempt behaviors. In other words, this um, the implicit associations test is used to predict future attempts to a significant degree, and the patient doesn't necessarily know that you're evaluating their suicide risk um, in terms of prospective attempt behaviors. That's how you get your MacArthur Genius Award. So um, there are replications of the IAT um, with decent sensitivity and specificity, um, replications up in Canada. Um, there's a lot of interest in the use of the IAT. Matt's also um, developed a suicide Stroop. The Stroop test has been used in cognitive neuroscience for many years. Um, this is just a, um, a matter of adding suicide stimulus to the, the standard Stroop test. Um, we've done a dot probe test at NIH uh, with suicide uh, stimulus words. It's just kind of getting at this idea that at a sub-threshold level, do people default to a, a suicidal um, thinking? And can that be fleshed out by an intentional bias kind of assessment? In a similar vein, Marianne Goodman, who's a psychiatrist at Mount Sinai Hospital, has done a really interesting study um, where she wires up uh, the patient's face, the uh, orbic orbiculus oculi, the muscles around the eye, um, to measure a startle response or an eye blink response. The paradigm basically is that the subject is wired up and has uh, headphones that cue a stimulus, and the stimulus comes on a computer, and uh, the nature of it is that we're all going to blink when the stimulus comes on. What Marianne found was that for pleasant images, there's no differential response in eye blink or startle response as measured by eye blinks for people who have only ever ideated versus people with the neutral images who've attempted. All right, so I'm not explaining this clearly. Here's the ideation sample. Here's the single attempter sample. Here's the multiple attempter sample. We know from the literature that people who have made two or more bona fide attempts are forever a different person with much greater risk than persons who've only ever ideated or have made a single attempt. And where that really pops is when there's an unpleasant image. For example, a person who's wincing with a gun to their head, um, what you see is that the multiple attempters are much more reactive in terms of their blink response to that startling image. It all comes down to uh, a, a kind of dysregulated state, a kind of sensitivity that we can measure using these implicit association uh, methodologies. One more whack at this is Judy Famaloni's work um, using actually night vision goggles that are trained on the subject's face and thumb. These are thermal imaging cameras that are worn by um, combat soldiers at night. It's a huge tactical advantage. 
Judy had the idea of actually using it in the context of an interview to um, detect autonomic activity. So if I've asked you a question now about PTSD or, or body parts or something uh, um, that's provocative, suicidal thoughts, um, what your body will do if you're sensitive to that topic is like my body react to that in terms of an opening of the pores on the, the face, the bridge of the nose and on the thumb um, in real time in proximity to the question I just asked. So it's yet another methodology of trying to you know, get some convergent methods of people who are sensitive limbically and, and perhaps autonomically sensitive and reactive. And that's very relevant to the treatments that we're gonna talk about here in a moment. Um, what we know is that the limbic system is, is really critical and the amygdala is really critical in activated states. And when we get dysregulated and activated, a lot of times that means that the frontal lobes shut down. And uh, that's never good because um, our frontal lobes are so special and so valuable. So what I'm gonna describe to you in terms of the treatments is a recognition of I'm getting into a dysregulated state and I need to do things to make sure that my frontal lobes stay engaged and we, we, we keep cognitive control um, over uh, getting upset. Um, and that I, I basically think that's what our effective treatments do. Very hot area in assessment these days is machine learning. Um, we've got a recent project with Ron Kessler at Harvard um, with one of our data sets. Machine learning, I think, is exciting. I, I think it can be um, oversold. Uh, I, I want it both ways here. I want to acknowledge the promise of it to route patients to treatments that are, are best suited to them, thereby saving tremendous healthcare dollars, um, but to not think it's going to be the be all and end all. What's interesting in this particular study that came out of uh, David Brent's lab at Western Psych is that they use machine learning um, to identify an ideational sample versus a control sample who don't have ideation um, so that they can look through medical records, they can look through oftentimes extensive databases that involve thousands of variables. The software um, creates algorithms that, in this case, differentiate a suicide ideation sample versus a control sample. And then they have the clever idea of putting these folks in the magnet and asking them about suicide. And so these circled areas are how different brains of suicidal people versus non-suicidal people light up, um, which is just a, a big correlational way of saying, gosh, suicidal people, uh, br their brains work differently. Um, but the sample was interestingly um, uh, differentiated or stratified by machine learning. One of the big innovations that we're thrilled about in our field is the development of safety planning. Um, when I was first growing up, and still I got to say to the present day, there's a lot of clinicians who use no harm contracts, uh, no suicide contracts, getting people to commit to their safety, which is focused on what you promised not to do, versus uh, stabilization planning, which focuses on what you will do should you get in a dysregulated dark moment. And Barbara um, Stanley and Greg Brown really are the ones that sort of put this on the map with their safety plan intervention. Um, on the left-hand side here, you see the, the, uh, the VA's version of the safety plan intervention. It's a six-step process, starting out with uh, identifying warning signs or triggers, uh, internal coping strategies, people that I can reach out to to distract me, people I can ask for help, um, professional help, and then ultimately uh, lethal means discussions. Um, this became VA policy before anybody proved it worked. Good news is that um, Barbara and Greg had a paper that came out in JAMA last year showing in a cohort comparison sample that this safety plan um, is effective in reducing attempt behaviors. A cousin of the safety plan intervention is something called the crisis response plan. This was originally developed by David Rudd, but further elaborated by his collaborator, uh, Craig Bryan. Uh, and Craig um, did a really nice study that was published in the Journal of Affective Disorders. Um, the crisis response plan is a very idiosyncratic, personalized version of, the, of this idea of stabilization planning. Like the safety plan intervention, they identify warning signs or triggers and different kinds of coping strategies and then different people to reach out for help. It's done on an index card in the patient's own hand. And then sometimes they laminate that and have the patient actually carry it on their person. And what's really cool about this is that um, Craig did a study um, with the military showing that definitively, that crisis response planning, this one touch intervention, reduced attempt behaviors by um, over 
and also decreased suicidal ideation, a one-touch intervention that is uh, meant to be the remedy for the no-harm contract. So we now know that no-harm contracts don't work and that safety planning and crisis response planning does work. We also know it's really important to talk about lethal means. Uh, we call this lethal means safety. We don't call it um, means restriction because that tends to be um, upsetting to people who are firearm owners. Um, so the, the politically correct term now is lethal means safety and, um, and less of a threatening kind of idea for people that have firearms. Um, in any event, uh, we know the lifeline is effective. Maddie Gould's research, um, John Califat, Brian Mishara's research. The problem with the lifeline is that it's beyond its capacity um, and we need more people on the lifeline. But it is effective and a, a reliable uh, resource that should be part of people's uh, treatment planning. Um, we also know that lethal means discussions are very important. Um, Kathy Barber and Matt Miller at Harvard's research shows that when we reduce or uh, limit access to lethal means, particularly a firearm, there's not then a related method substitution. If there's a bridge barrier that's put up, people then don't just bump over to another, uh, another means. Very interesting here in Washington, we have a uh, Rock Creek Park that goes to the middle of the district. Then we have two bridges um, that are adjacent to each other over Rock Creek Park. And the bridge in the 70s that was the main bridge that people would jump from has bridge barriers that basically eliminated suicidal jumps from that bridge. Um, uh, but the Duke Ellington Bridge is about 300 feet away and people don't go over there and jump off that bridge. So um, it, it's quite astonishing, this research where um, a, a favorite spot or a means are, are limited and um, you don't necessarily then see people then doing something else. It really does make a difference. All this then leads up to a discussion of treatments that work for suicidal risk. And for people that don't know this literature, it's dominated by psychological interventions. Um, the medication approach is um, very limited um, and not well replicated. Um, I think there's actually a fair amount of magical thinking on this topic. Um, we want medicines to be more effective than they are, when in fact we have psychological treatments that are quite effective but not widely used. There's about 80 randomized controlled trials um, for suicidal ideation and behavioral outcomes as primary outcomes. Uh, we know that there's increased risk post-discharge in the hospital. That's been replicated many times. Um, and there's a handful of treatments with single RCTs, but they need replication. What I want to say about hospitalization is not that it's totally ineffective. We just don't have data that it is. And what we do have data from NAMI and different kinds of patient consumer groups is that these hospital stays are very brief and they're not sufficiently, in my mind, in my bias, suicide focused. They're not necessarily getting stabilization plans. They're not necessarily getting interventions that are gonna be relevant for them with regard to suicide risk post-discharge because the hospitalizations tend to focus on mental disorders like major depression or schizophrenia. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. I'm just saying we need to really supplement that focus with suicide focused care during the hospital stay. When we look at the replicated randomized controlled trial data, this is the laundry list of what works. DBT, two forms of cognitive therapy, the CAMS approach, which is coming out of my lab, and different kinds of caring contact. As I alluded to, medications for suicide risk, uh, the data is mixed. Um, there are people who, who say very strongly that we got treatmental disorders. Um, there are at least three, um, multi, uh, three meta-analyses showing that treating depression doesn't touch ideation or attempt behaviors. Now, there, there may be an RCT underway right now of a drug that's going to decrease attempt behaviors in ideation and be published in four or five different trials. Um, that doesn't exist. There's pretty good evidence for lithium from a meta-analysis in one RCT, and there's one RCT for the use of clozapine with schizophrenia, um, but that's not been replicated. Um, and so, and the data for SSRIs are very mixed. There is evidence that ketamine works about half the time, low-dose ketamine IV infused. Um, it does reduce ideation and creates a phenomenological shift for about half the patients that take it, but there's not evidence that more ketamine necessarily recreates the effect, and the effect lasts a matter of days, two to four, maybe five days. So more ketamine is not necessarily the solution, but it can be used tactically, maybe in an emergency department, as a means of stabilizing somebody to get them to proper care. Uh, AFSP funded a, a grant for nitrous oxide, laughing gas. Um, it may be a great study, but I, I find myself just saying, you know, laughing gas. So 
maybe it's the the be all and end all. Um, and I don't mean any disrespect for those researchers, but I I think it just speaks to almost like a desperateness to find a pill to take versus treatments that we know are effective but are not widely used. I'm not a prescriber, so this is clearly my bias, but there's the data and I'm open to other data that contradict my view on this. In any case, the RCT support is mixed at best. Contrast, we have 18 RCTs for DBT. This is Marshall Linehan, the developer of dialectical behavior therapy. DBT is pretty labor intensive and probably um, shouldn't be used for everybody, but for highly dysregulated multiple tempters, it is absolutely effective in reducing attempts and self-harm behavior. Recent meta-analysis came out of the University of Washington, 18 studies, uh, three of which showed a signal for ideation as well. So DBT is really the gold standard of replicated, independent, empirically validated treatment for suicidal risk. Of course, Marsha has been hard at work for about 30, 40 years in all this. Um, the DBT skills manual came out a few years ago. Um, there's resources on the BTEC website um, and, of course, her source books. The thing about DBT is that it's a team treatment. It's not done individually. Um, there's a lot of people that talk about doing DBT that is not really DBT. There's the full uh, skills group, individual backing up the skills, uh, phone coaching, and then the consultation supervision team. That's what DBT is. Anything other than that is not really DBT. Uh, here's Tim Beck, who is still with us. He's well into his 90s at this point, but still active in the lab, um, along with Greg Brown. Their seminal paper in 2005 and published in, um, in JAMA Psychiatry uh, was a, of the cognitive therapy intervention. Um, Dr. Beck is the first to really develop the idea of, a, of the suicidal mode, and we uh, are huge fans of his work and the idea here of a of a HOPE kit and a re prevention protocol that's become quite famous. Um, David Rudd and Craig Bryant had developed a, a cousin of a CTSP called BCBT. They published a paper a few years ago um, with suicidal soldiers in, uh, at Fort Carson, um, heavily deployed soldiers in combat environments and demonstrate a 60% reduction. I think I was remiss to say, um, in this study they found a 50% reduction in attempt behaviors, which is a big deal between groups, and that was replicated by David and Craig with a 60% reduction in this phasic treatment that's suicide-focused. Um, I should add David and Craig's book. There's now a Guilford Press book on BCBT. There's this uh, book written by Amy Wenzel, Greg, and Tim on the CTSP intervention um, that is available through American Psychological Association. The big challenge with these two um, CBT-oriented treatments is that there's not a ready training program. There are books and published papers but um, access to um, CT or P, CTSP or BCBT um, is you have to basically corral these guys to do a training and it's pretty labor intensive. So that's an issue. My favorite would be the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality or the CAMS approach developed by my lab at Catholic University. Um, CAMS is a suicide focused framework, so it's not a new psychotherapy. Um, we put suicide in, in the bullseye of our intervention um, and we have a very particular way of deconstructing what it means to be suicidal. What you see here are various forms. This is the first session version of the suicide status form um, that is completed sitting in a side-by-side -side seating arrangement next to the patient with their permission, because the goal here is to deconstruct what it means for you to be suicidal. When, where, how, why are you suicidal, and what can we learn about that? The first page is completed in the patient's hand. Second page, still sitting side by side of risk and warning signs, is completed by the, with the clinician, with the patient looking on as we're completing the assessment. Here's the treatment plan that in standard CAMS is designed to keep you out of the hospital, if at all possible. But to do that, we've got to develop a stabilization plan, and we also want to identify and treat target drivers. So we ask the patient, what are the two problems that make you want to kill yourself? and we develop goals and interventions for those problems. It could be everything from behavioral activation to psychoanalytic insights, psychotherapy, to medication, to group, to couples therapy. Whatever treats a driver is something that we can integrate into the CAMS treatment plan. There's also a page here for additional medical record documentation, and that multi-purpose assessment, treatment planning, and tracking tool um, is the roadmap that guides the process of CAMS. For subsequent sessions, we have a interim tracking version of the form. We begin with a core assessment 
and we end with a treatment plan update. We always tweak and update the stabilization plan. We always check in on the suicidal drivers and are our treatments for these drivers being effective. For any outcome, we have then a final set of SSF forms for outcome and disposition. So it's really a multi-purpose assessment, treatment plan, tracking to outcome tool. You're doing most of your medical record documentation in session with the patient. And if you know anything about malpractice liability, you're now decreasing your liability significantly by the quality of your, of your documentation. In the CAMS model, we critique the idea of suicide as a symptom of psychopathology, where the clinician knows best and where suicide is relegated to symptom status, um, subject, subjected to or subjugated under depression. We're trying to keep the patient out of the hospital. We're trying to treat what the patient says makes them suicidal, and we use stabilization plans versus no harm contracts. The CAMS model, we look at suicide through the eyes of the patient. Our goal is to deconstruct what it means for them to be suicidal using the suicide status form. They may say their depression is what's causing them to be suicidal. We'll typically ask them, what makes you depressed? Overwhelmingly, it's relationships. It's my work or vocation. Um, it might be um, the severity of my mental illness. Um, but whatever those problems are, we target and treat and don't presume that depression is the cause of your suicidal risk. So patients are really good at telling us what makes them want to kill themselves, and CAMS have been proven to be effective in treating those problems. So there's a philosophy here. Um, it's very consistent with the model, Sarah, that you described. It's patient-centric. We honor the patient's struggle. We validate their experience. We never shame, we never blame. It's collaborative in nature. We're honest and transparent throughout the process. Um, we're focused on suicide, we're outpatient oriented, and we try to be flexible, we would say non-denominational. Uh, the Danes love CAMS and the group that we work with is almost all psychoanalytic. Um, other clinicians are much more kind of behavioral or humanistic. We can kind of handle all comers. Um, to be adherent to CAMS, if you're in one of our randomized controlled trials, we're um, using the CAMS rating scale to see if you've been collaborative in your assessment and collaborative in your treatment planning. We watch videos of clinicians trying to master the intervention. CAMS is not hard to learn. Most clinicians learn to use it with adherence in four sessions with their first patient. By their third or fourth patient, they're really kind of owning it and making it um, consistent with their sort of philosophy of practice. Um, we identify suicidal drivers, and we then problem-focused uh, treat these problem drivers in the final phase of CAMS is development of reasons for living. Stole this directly from Marsha um, and just really feel that it's, we gotta do more than just relapse prevention. We really need to have people that have purpose and meaning in a life worth living. So um, this gives you a bit of an impression of the process. Here's the first page completed by the patient in their own hand. We have various quantitative assessments and qualitative prompts and patients tell us really interesting things about what's going on with them. Um, here are our risk and warning signs that we gather, ideation, attempt history, and so forth. Then to develop a treatment plan. The first non-negotiable problem is your stabilization. And to do that, we then create a stabilization plan. And then we identify the problem drivers and treat these with whatever treatments make sense. We're very focused on lethal mean safety. We had a soldier in our study at Fort Stewart who had a stash of pills back at the barracks. The clinician um, asked her to bring the pills in, and it was a lot of pills. So in, um, in collecting medication like this, we've now made her environment significantly less lethal, and uh, it's a big uh, commitment to the treatment that we appreciate. This is what we call our HIPAA page, where we, got, we um, document mental status, DSM or ICD diagnosis, uh, overall judgment of risk, and your case notes. So this then becomes the medical record. The HIPAA page is completed after the session takes two to four minutes. Here's the interim tracking update form. We begin the session with our core assessment. The session then focuses on your stabilization plan and treating drivers. The session ends with a treatment plan update. We will make sure that these drivers are in fact the ones that we need to treat or they may evolve. And we evolve, we call that driver specificity or sharpening the driver. And here's our additional HIPAA page documentation. So lots of record keeping that is highly protective and reflects good practice. We're after three consecutive sessions where the overall risk is a one or a two. They're managing the thoughts and feelings and there's no suicidal behavior. And we account for that right here. When that occurs, we have gotten into an outcome disposition. Treating the drivers, we can use whatever methods make sense. These are a few of my favorites. And working towards a life worth living to meet the criteria I just described, 
to get to an outcome disposition that is a resolved case. So one or two, managing the thoughts and feelings and behaviors for three consecutive sessions. Okay, so the core SSF is administered for every CAM session. Patients start developing an internal working model of what this is, and every session ends with a treatment plan update, in this case, outcome disposition, and a final HIPAA page. So lots of documentation that's highly protective. We've got a ton of correlational studies, um, three with non-randomized control groups, all basically finding the same thing. But the big focus in the recent years has been on randomized control trials. And we now have four published RCTs, um, one trial that's being written up, and three ongoing trials at Harborview Hospital in Seattle, um, an inpatient unit in Germany, and a new trial um, funded by the VA in San Diego. And the data is good. We have eight published trials, one meta-analysis, four published RCTs. We know the CAMS reduces uh, suicidal ideation in six to eight sessions and all these other good things as well. The jury's still out on ideation and attempt behaviors, um, but looks promising. Um, relatively easy to learn, increased clinical ad adherence and uh, retention, um, all good stuff. And so uh, what I want to impress upon you is that uh, the field is more evolved than people think. And what we do in practice is not necessarily reflective of what works. I think um, there is, I'm giving a talk later this week at the American Association of Suicidology. It's a talk on um, uh, one size treatment does not fit all. And what I mean by that is that we really got to think outside the box if we're gonna make a difference with our rates of suicide that just keep on stubbornly creeping up. And so what I mean by that is um, we've got to realize that we'll never clinically treat our way out of this problem. 10.6 million Americans suffer with suicidal thoughts. For a lot of you, the patients that you're working with, they're plagued with suicidal thoughts. There'll never be enough psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and counselors. What we, I would argue, actually need is a Peace Corps level initiative a mental health service core of uh, paraprofessionals, people with lived experience for sure, um, college students coming out of college with loan forgiveness. We need a massive workforce, something like AmeriCorps, Peace Corps is what I'm thinking. And if we were able to marshal a force like that, we could train them in stabilization planning and lethal means safety. They could person the national lifeline. We have capacity issues. We don't have enough good people who are competently trained and supervised to provide the support for the capacity issues that the lifeline experiences. And I hate to be crass, but over here on the x-axis, the tail that wags the dog of all this is the money. And the most expensive thing that we think all suicidal people should get is just too expensive and not suicide specific enough in my humble opinion, but also based on the data. So our inpatient care has to become much more suicide focused and we need care that uh, service, um, not this maximum level of care, but different levels of intensity. And the good news is we've got treatments that I've just described to you that layer into this model. Of course, CAMS does everything. Um, that creates an incredible scenario. Suicide-focused care delivered by paraprofessionals and mental health professionals that's evidence-based, least restrictive, and actually cost effective. Now, if we can get our policy and practices to match this vision, we would save more lives, save more money, and do things that actually work. And that's what I aspire to. So um, I hope this has been a helpful webinar. It's a quick run through, uh, something I could talk about all day long, but we only got this uh, 50 minute block. What I wanna say to you is that your population can benefit from these interventions. You work with severely mentally ill folks. We know, for example, that CAMS works with these populations. I used to have it as an exclusion criteria of using CAMS with psychotic patients until we started using with psychotic patients and seeing that the patients were quite responsive, uh, more than I expected. There's something about the suicide status form that's really sort of grounding for a lot of these patients. They like to go back through, in my experience, and look at their previous sessions um, but we have um, a number of cases that I can describe to you where we've treated patients with severe mental illness, treated their drivers, and they live with the voices, but they don't have to attempt suicide or take their life. And isn't that the point? 
So I'm really grateful, Sarah, for you inviting me to do this talk, and I hope it's been helpful to your network. And I really welcome um, any input from folks uh, across the, your network to um, certainly learn about these interventions. We've got a way to get there. We just got to actually make them reality in our clinical practices. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Jobes. That was incredibly informative, and I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. There are a couple of uh, take-home points that you shared with us that I wanted to take the opportunity to emphasize, um, and um, if that's okay with you, and, and feel free to clarify anything if, I've, uh, if I'm not getting it exactly right. Um, sure. One was that just in thinking about Joe Franklin's meta-analysis uh, that are risk factors that we've um, traditionally been fairly preoccupied with. Um, have remarkably low predictability, and that instead we should be focusing on not just warning signs, but as you said, personalized warning signs for suicide. Right. Uh, you gave you gave some great guidance to our clinicians to supplement clinical judgment with structured tools, and you shared with us those tools that are in public domain, and we'll go ahead and make those uh, available on our website along with this webinar to make it as easy to access those tools as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you also gave some very concrete guidance about a question that you give uh, that uh, you know that you ask of clients, which is when you think about suicide, does it comfort you or does it alarm you? So not just assessing for suicide in terms of the presence or absence of suicidal ideation, but really what are the cognitions around suicide and what's the emotional response to these suicidal thoughts? Yeah, one way that we think about, Sarah, is your relationship to suicide, which may seem kind of peculiar, but for a lot of suicidal people, it feels like a relationship. And for some, it's like a warm blanket that they've had with them for a long while to, to kind of get through difficult times. For others, it feels like a hot potato that they, they have, but they don't want. And those are kind of different people, and they probably need a different set of interventions, which is sort of a, a big takeaway that I hope people get. Yeah, that's helpful to have that question to really guide the clinician in thinking about what kind of interventions would be warranted and what, what should they be thinking about. Um, you also gave some really interesting uh, direction in terms of how we assess for suicidal ideation indirectly. And specifically, I think what was most practical for a routine care setting was the Kessler 10. And so that was a great um, resource. Is that is that in the public domain as well? No. Okay. So that's always an issue. Is, I mean, uh, and that's just one study we didn't replicate, but I mean, uh, the, the spirit of the indirect assessments, I, I think there may be a time, frankly, where the work that Matt, Matt, Matt Nock does is you, you can go into his lab at Harvard and he's got experiments with the modified Stroop, um, IAT, iBlink. And the idea would be that there might be uh, an assessment where you could do a number of these things all at once and they would incrementally add predictive validity um, because they're they're sort of getting at the, the same issue from all these different implicit autonomic ways. Mm -hmm. so interesting. That, would that would certainly be a lot more information for you to conduct your clinical interview if you had some sense of this person's sort of reactivity or dysregulation uh, propensity. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about the different settings that might be able to implement those kinds of assessments. Um, you gave a really important uh, reminder to all of us that no harm contracts are not recommended any longer and that we really want to be thinking about safety planning intervention or crisis response planning um, and that there's good solid research that shows that those interventions can save lives as right. well as lethal means safety that really uh, focusing on not just whether ideation is present, but if they actually have thought about how they would enact harm to themselves, that we can encourage them to bring to to kind of keep those uh, means uh, safe. Uh, something that I found really um, illuminating was that there was no support uh, in some re some of the recent literature for inpatient hospitalization. Uh, in terms of long-term risk for suicide, and that there is an increased risk of suicide post discharge. Yeah, that that data post discharge is pretty striking. Where it's a week, six weeks, six months, a year, and lifetime. So, I, I, it, what I feel sensitive to is anybody that works in patient care. I don't want them to feel criticized. I do want them to get more suicide focused for even a brief stay, and to think about disposition a lot more seriously 
yeah, I just want them to become more suicide focused. And right. one, of the, one of my favorite studies is being um, wrapped up this year is post-mission cognitive therapy or PACT, which Marjan Holloway has done here at Walter Reed, um, that for a five or six day hospital stay, you're actually getting the CTSP intervention so that when you're discharged, you have a different skill set than before you went on. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I spent the early part of my career working in patient care and we do inpatient versions of CAM. So I, I'm not, uh, I'm not about bashing inpatient care. I just want to eliminate the magical thinking, which is that you put somebody in the hospital for four or five days and some, something miraculous happens there that's suicide specific. There, there may be many miraculous things, but what I'm saying is the study at the University of Michigan that Cheryl King's lab did showed that a second hospitalization for a teenager uh, is correlated significantly with a much more severe suicidal trajectory and increased risk of attempts. And so um, it, it, the point is not eliminating inpatient care. The point is making our inpatient care much more relevant um, and much more suicide specific and getting better data in, instead of increasing the risk. Well, and I think also just to add to that, to ensure that our clinicians across clinical settings are getting good training in the evidence-based treatments for uh, suicidality, which, as you mentioned, are dialectical behavior therapy, collaborative assessment and management of suicidality, or CAMS, caring contacts, and then CBT interventions. Yeah. Uh, and so really that, that aligns nicely with our, our mission at, at the Northwest MHTTC, which is really to advance these evidence-based treatments. And as you mentioned, and I think was also a really important point, that these interventions can be used with individuals with psychosis and other serious mental illnesses. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm mindful of the time and I want to respect your time. You've been so generous with it. So thank you again for really uh, taking 50 years of research and turning that into a brief webinar with some very pragmatic tips and strategies for clinicians to take into practice. You bet, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So if you'd like to get in touch with our center, you can do so by emailing us at northwest at mhttcnetwork.org or through our website at the URL www.mhttcnetwork.org backslash Northwest. Uh, there you'll find some links to upcoming trainings, online trainings, resources, and research updates. And just to give you a sneak peek into two upcoming training opportunities that we'll be linking to through our website, one is a, a three-hour e-learning course on the topics of confidentiality, duty to warn, and violence risk assessment. And the second, just to continue with our theme of uh, suicide, is uh, All Patients Safe, which was developed by Forefront here at the University of Washington. And this is suicide prevention training geared towards medical professionals. So please visit our website for more resources and trainings. And thank you again for taking the time to join us today.